PilotSafety.org is a volunteer group dedicated to reducing general aviation accidents by providing free and low-cost safety training for pilots. Learn more now at PilotSafety.org. Our speaker today is Gary Reeves. He volunteers as a Young Eagles flight leader for the EAA. Gary has over 6,000 hours, is an ATP and a master flight, instrument, and multi-engine instructor. Of the 112,000 instructors in the U.S., less than 800 have ever been named master instructor. Gary is one of only 13 to have earned this designation in California. He is a nationally recognized expert in Avidyne and Garmin avionics, FlyQ, for flight, and instrument flying. In May 2016, Avidyne selected Gary Reeves and Pilot Safety as their national training provider. In 2016, Gary was awarded the FAA Instructor of the Year for the Western Pacific region, which includes Arizona, California, Hawaii, and Nevada. This means he is one of the top eight instructors in the whole country. Please welcome 2016 Western Pacific Regional Instructor of the Year and Master CFI, Gary Reed. <laughs> It's always nice to get a big warm welcome from my minions. Hi guys, how are you? Uh, guys and ladies, I certainly appreciate it. Congratulations on you buying a shiny new Avidyne Navigator. You're gonna love it. I know because I love mine. I really, really enjoyed becoming a, a Garmin expert and loved having the 430 in my airplane and thought it was just the greatest thing ever until I replaced it with an Avidyne. The Avidyne has made flying so much simpler. The units are so much smarter. You're never, ever going to be happier in your life once you get really good at this. So I want to say thank you to Avidyne for giving me uh, such an opportunity, especially to two spe specific guys, Jared and Simpson, who from day one have believed in me and really made Avidyne the first national company to include a training video with avionics and if you've ever bought any other avionics i don't care if it's a gps an autopilot or a radio you may have gotten a, a manual sealed in plastic but you never got a training video with it before and uh, avidyne as always is just leading the way in safety so thank you guys want to warn you this is just the beginning and we're going to go real real fast there he is five and a half, almost six hours of training available if you go over to pilotsafety.org, click on the Avidyne and you can get very detailed information to really make you a pro with the Avidyne, including uh, every single button, every single function, in-depth, in-flight footage, both VFR, IFR, missed approaches, holding, everything you need to know to really become a pro, especially in emergency use. And if you happen to uh, have bought this uh, navigator or gotten this video before Oshkosh 2016, don't worry about it. You'll get a free 10.2 upgrade video as soon as it's released. What well, we're going to cover today and we're going to go pretty fast. Stick around though to the very end, even if you know some of it, because I guarantee you'll pick up a couple really good tips. The functions of all the keys and knobs, the power on self test, how to update a database, com, nav, and source tuning, chapters and pages, custom waypoints, flight planning, IFR procedures, and some important alerts. Let's start out with the functions of the keys and knobs. Now most of this video is going to be based on the 440 because there is no difference between the 440, 540, and 550 in the way most of the knobs work. The only difference is because the 540 and the 550 are a little bit bigger, they have a little bit more real estate and they'll show the nav frequencies 
as well as the COM frequencies, where on the 440 you have to change. And of course there's some upgraded benefits to the 550 as well, including synthetic vision. But this is just an introduction, so let me show you how all of their navigators have the same buttons and they work the same way. There's a volume, power, and squelch knob in the top left, and a CDI nav source in the top right. Just above that CDI nav source is a little photo lens that will automatically adjust the brightness of the screen depending if it's getting darker or lighter in the cabin if you use that setting. There's a frequency swap button to move standby up to active and vice versa. There's three line select keys which perfectly match the touch screen keys on the inside. So you'll notice there's three line buttons and there's a land, nav, and a weather overlay matching on the display. You can use either one. And this is one of the ways that Avidyne has really made flying so much easier. All touchscreen devices, especially in turbulence, including iPads, are very hard to use in moderate turbulence or above. I fly a lot of mountain flying. I live in the mountains. I do a lot of hard IFR. And let me tell you, touchscreens are pretty much just dead bang useless in turbulence. The advantage of the Avidyne Navigator is that the Avidyne Navigators have all of the functions available by knob as well, so you're not dependent on your finger bouncing around the screen. We do have some dedicated function keys. We have a cam latch, and that cam latch is just where you unscrew the Garmin and screw this one right back in. Um, they are a direct plug and play replacement. There's a USB port where not only do we update the databases, we keep our iPads charged or iPhones or whatever you want to keep charged. I got to tell you the biggest problem as an iPad Pro, I go all over the country teaching four flight and fly Q classes, is that on a four hour flight, my iPad will always go low power about the time I get to the final approach fix in instrument conditions. Never ever happened since I put in the Avidyne because I just keep it charged the whole time. We also have page function keys, and there are three of them. The flight management, FMS, map, and auxiliary. We have a context sensitive knob. Pushing that activates the cursor, the big knob moves the cursor, and the little knob changes things. And we have COM, NAV, manual tuning knobs. Pushing the button changes it from COM to NAV. Big knob, big numbers, little knob, little numbers. So let's talk about the power, volume, and squelch button. If you twist it to the right, we'll turn the volume up. If you twist it to the left, we'll volume down. And if you push it once, it will do an ID or in COM mode, do a squelch so you can set the volume and turn it power on. So let's show a power on self test. So I've just pushed that button. It'll go through a splash screen and then go to a warning where you have to agree to use this responsibly. Part of using this as responsibly is a required IFR self-check. Staying on that splash screen before you continue, before you blindly push enter buttons, you must look at the CDI or OBS connected to it. And this OBS must show a half scale left deflection, a half scale up deflection. Both the nav and the GPS lights should be on. It must show a TO or two indication, and there should be no flags. This is a required pre-flight inspection for IFR use. Then we can go back and push that enter button. And if any databases are expired, it will now show you these and show you them in yellow. If it doesn't show you the databases, then they are current. If you're not sure, there's a manual way to check it. So from anywhere, all you have to do is push the auxiliary page button. Touch the system tab. Touch the status software button. And that will show you your current databases. Mine are both current now because they're both shown in white. So true or false, you can legally fly IFR as a slant Gulf airplane with an expired aviation database using the Avidyne IFD. Well, that's true. If you can back it up with current maps and you just can't shoot GPS approaches under IFR rules. 
You can shoot practice approaches in visual conditions with an expired database. Uh, if you're flying a, a plane at a school that typically rental airplanes don't update the databases as often, so you can still practice with it. You just can't use it for IFR approaches when you're legally IFR. Notice I said IFR, not IMC. If you're on an IFR clearance, it requires a current database. Doesn't matter if you're VMC or IMC. So the nav radio volume button is pretty simple. If you push the bottom left knob to change it to nav, now we can twist the volume up to the right, we can twist the volume left to turn it down, and we can push it once to do the ID function. Now it will automatically ID nav aids for you if it's picking up, but if you want to listen to the nav aids, just remember to select nav 1 or nav 2 on your audio panel. I encourage this, even though the Avidine is super smart. If the Avidine says ILGB or the PDZ VOR or whatever, that's considered legally identified. If the navigator does it for you, you're done. I still like all my students to listen because this may not be the only plane you ever fly and you really want to get in the habit of manually listening to nav aids with older units. The COM flip-flop button, pretty simple. You just push it to change the standby frequency shown there in white. It would then flip it to the primary frequency or active frequency, which is on top and in green. And you just push it once and it'll flip-flop them for you. Same exact things works with nav. Whatever's in the standby, the white, will go to the primary or active green. You just push that button, no big deal. Now, there's a couple different ways you can actually change COM frequencies. There's actually four different ways. One is something called autofill, where the Avidine will automatically look for the nearest appropriate frequencies. You can actually just twist the knobs, big knob, big numbers, little knob, little numbers, or you can touch the frequency and use one of two different keyboards. So, if you twist a little knob, it will automatically try and autofill for you, and you can select the frequency you want to use from airport, in route, or recent. And notice it just auto tunes it for you and automatically identifies it. Big knob in route, touch center, there we go. Or I can go back to recent. So there's several different ways to do it. Now I can also just use the little knob for little numbers and the big knob for big numbers. Or I can use one of two included keyboards. So if I just touch that, it'll bring up a keyboard on the screen. And you can just do the middle numbers. So instead of 120.500, if you just put in 205, it'll work. Or you can do the same shortcut on the keyboard. 340 will automatically load as 134.0. Nav tuning, very, very similar. You can use the knobs, the frequencies, or the names. So let's do one. I'm going to switch to the nav, and I'm just going to touch it. Actually, I don't need to touch it. I'll just do little knob, little numbers, big knob, big numbers, tune in 113.6, and that'll go LAX into the active frequency. You know it's active because it's green. If I touch it, I can type in a frequency. 157 will load up 115.7. I can make that active. Or I can type in the name of it. So if I just touch P-O-M, it'll load Pomona, and see how it figures it out for me? It always loads the nearest waypoint that's called Geofill. And I can do the same thing. I can just hit P-D, and it will automatically figure out that's Paradise 112.2. And that's just why, or one great example of how Avidine just makes flying so much easier. And I will tell you, as a professional IFR instructor, I go all over the country and teach people Avidine avionics and, and iPad use and instrument flying. Instrument flying is so dangerous 
that single pilot IFR is illegal in most of Europe. So by being so smart with geofill, by allowing shortcut frequencies entries, Avidyne has just made flying a whole bunch safer. So let me show you how to pair a keyboard because that's one of the first things you're, you're gonna do. To pair a keyboard, all you do is push the auxiliary page, touch the systems tab, and we need to go into maintenance mode by pushing download logs. We'll and then it will shut down, reload, and come up with this screen. When it restarts in maintenance mode, touch the configuration tab, big knob to the left or to the right, and scroll, to, scroll through until you find Bluetooth setup. First thing we're going to do is take your keyboard, turn it to power on, You'll notice a green light, flip it over, and there's a Bluetooth button. So watch, I'll start the scan, I'll push the Bluetooth connect button, and it automatically finds it. Once it finds it, I can stop the scan and push pair device. Now it's given me a code of 1793 plus the enter button. So 1793, push the enter button, and it's paired. Now we go back to update and push done to let it automatically reboot. We'll push enter, and now it will load into FMS mode. We're going to do flight plan, and I'm going to push the enter button to pair the keyboard. I'll now push allow, and go ahead and enter a waypoint. I'll push the enter button, push the enter button again, and type in Papa Delta Zulu, enter, and now that will show Paradise. Now you'll notice I have a bright yellow warning in the bottom right. Because filming this video, my GPS navigator is out of the plane and actually in a ground docking station. Um, they're available through a company called Commander. Um, it provides power to the GPS but it's not hooked up to any radios, and that's what it's saying. There's no communication with the VHAF antenna. That's why my auxiliary button is also bright yellow. So now that you've paired the keyboard and we put the GPS back in the plane, what do you do? Well, I just put Velcro on the back and I put it right in the center of my yoke. This is an incredibly great place to put it and makes it easy to use even during flying. Easier than reaching for the navigator and you can do many of the functions just by touching the wireless keyboard and more functions are actually being added. Now the clear button is pretty simple. It does a couple things. Of course it will clear an entry if you didn't want to do that. It will also act as a backspace if you're typing in frequencies or names and you can also use it to acknowledge an alert like that not talking to the VHF antenna alert we had. The direct to button, pretty simple, does what you would expect. You have to just choose where you want to go direct to. You, if you push it once, it will always select the next waypoint in your flight plan that is selected. You can, though, go to any waypoint in the flight plan just by moving the cursor with the big knob, or if you activate the cursor by pushing in the little knob on the right, you can pick any waypoint in the country. So let me show you that. Right now I've got a flight plan to Santa Barbara. I was selected Santa Barbara. I don't want to go that, so I'm going to hit the clear button. 
big knob and select a different waypoint. In this case, I'll select Wilma, direct to, enter to, D2E2 will automatically go to that button. So the direct to button once and the enter button two times. I can then change that to any waypoint in my database. And again, D2E2 is the shortcut in an emergency. Let's talk about the procedure key. This is for, of course, us IFR pilots. You can select approaches, you can select arrivals, you can select uh, standard instrument departures. In this case, I'm going to show you um, going to a nearby airport quickly to select either an initial approach vect or activate vectors to final. So right now, I've got a direct to Torrance being one of my nearest uh, airport selected, so I've already hit direct to Torrance, and now I'm just going to push the procedure button. The ILS, enter. I want to scroll down and use Seal Beach as initial approach fix, enter. You'll notice there's a gap, and on the left it says activate approach in the bottom left of my screen. But I can scroll th through there and show every leg including the missed approaches. Now that to activate, it's saying GPS to VLOC. When I get a certain distance from the final approach fix, it will automatically switch to the 111.9, the localizer frequency. Because I'm not flying, I'm on the ground, I'm going to manually change to VLOC and put in the correct course on my OBS. Now if I'm really having an emergency, I'm going to use procedure vectors Touch the Activate Approach button twice. Touch my Map button, and I've now activated Vectors to Final. And you can see I can move around the screen, zoom in and zoom out. I do want to encourage all of you uh, instrument pilots to only use the Vector to Final button in emergencies. It's not the correct way to do it. I'm not saying if air traffic control says turn left for Vectors to Final, you shouldn't acknowledge it and accept it. Hey, anything that gets you on the ground and turns off that nasty Hobbs meter quicker, I'm all in favor of. But you don't want to get in the habit of using the vector to final button because it then gets rid of any step down fixes lined up with the final outside. So for homework, everybody look at the localizer DME24 Fullerton. What would happen is you would eliminate several step down fixes. So you're going to lose some situational awareness. The correct way to do it, and this is covered in depth in our IFR chapter on the, the six hour program, is you always activate the leg you're going to intercept on the instrument approach, but truly to be correct, you should only use the vectors to final in an emergency. Let's talk about the FMS button or the flight management system. Let's talk about the FMS page. Push in the center of the FMS button. It'll start on the left. We have three soft keys. Activate flight plan, view expanded, and delete origin. And a flight plan tab that interchanges with a map tab. If we scroll to the right by pushing on the right side of the FMS, we'll go into info, where we can scroll up and down with the little knob. You'll notice I'm in Long Beach. I can activate or open boxes by pushing on the little button. I can actually show runway 7 left 25 right and scroll through all the other runways. I can close those boxes. Departures, arrivals, approaches, and weather. I can either use the rocker to the right or just touch the route button and with my finger go up and down through my routes or use the big knob. I also have activate route, invert, and copy buttons. I'll use the rocker to the right to waypoint. Here's an SFRA custom waypoint that we'll create later. I can rocker to the right and use nearest. Now I'm not getting a nearest position because my GPS is inside a docking station and not connected to the current GPS.
the map page, or what I call the map chapter, is easily gotten to just by pushing the center of that map button. And you know it's active because it's highlighted green. So right now I'm in the auxiliary page. If I want to go to the map page, or what I call the map chapter, I'm just going to push the map button. You'll notice I have data blocks that I can pull open and close if I want a bigger map. And I also have some soft keys. Right there I have land to get rid of land data to declutter the map. I can get rid of nav data. Or I can just use the line select keys to the left, which do the exact same thing. Turn the knob to the right to reduce, the knob left to make it larger. I can also zoom in, out, and move the map touch screen with my fingers. And you'll notice I can bring all that data back. So the pro tip to remember is turning the knob left makes the map larger, shows a bigger area. Turning the knob right will reduce. So left larger, right reduce. Let's go to the auxiliary page, or what I call the auxiliary chapter. Pretty simple. See here I'm on the map page, and I'm just going to push the auxiliary button. Now I'm on the audio tab. I have an alert. If I push the alert tab, look, I have no GPS or radio connection because I'm in that docking station. Let's go back to the audio. You notice I can also change things with the rocker key. Volume, that controls the alerts that it gives you. Let's load a couple presets. I'm going to hit Edit, Activate my cursor, and let's put in the ATIS for my home airport. One, two, seven, seven, five. Oh, but wait, I forgot the decimal point. Well, it's going to tell me that. Okay. So I'm just going to put in more numbers and push in Enter. It's still invalid. I needed to clear that wrong thing. So let's try it again. 1, 2, 7, point 7, 5. Enter. There we go. Big knob. Move the cursor. Push. Activate it. And again, now I can just big knob, big numbers, little knob, little numbers. There's my clearance delivery. Big knob, big numbers, little knob, little numbers. I'll go ahead and put in ground. So since I always take off from Long Beach, uh, well, not always, but half the time, I'm just going to preload ATIS clearance ground and the common tower and SoCal frequencies. So I can just very quickly go bink, 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 bink. And you can even install buttons in your plane on your yoke that will cycle through these. Then all I have to do is hit Enter. And when I'm connected to my VHF antennas, it will then auto-tune all of those frequencies. Now, if I go to the next tab, which is Utility, I have Timers, Calculators, and Checklist. Why don't I put in a really quick checklist? So what I'll do is I'll make sure I'm on the Utility tab, touch Edit, and let's name the first checklist, Before Taxi. Oh, too many E's. Let's back up there using the clear button. Now, you can't uppercase and lowercase on your own, but the first letter of the first word will always be uppercase. Now what I want to do is just select it, and now let's add items. So I'm going to add some items here. So before taxi, I want to make sure my beacon light is on. Activate my cursor again, or just touch it. Either one works. Going to turn on my position. And taxi lights on. And yes, I know I misspelled lights. Don't worry about it. Taxi diagram. 
out in front of me. Remember, 91103 says you got to have a taxi diagram out in front of you if you're going to move an airplane at a towered airport. That's not new. And you can see I can also change things just by doing the knobs if I prefer to put one letter in at a time instead of typing. So I'm going to make sure that I get the ATIS written down. Boy, I just can't spell with that keyboard. <laughs> Let's try that again. Clearance before ground, of course. There we go. Now I'll put in ground and hopefully spell it correctly. Get rid of my edit. Now all I have to do, go back to the directory. If I just touch enter or the button, I can now manually select the ones I've completed. The biggest difference between an airline pilot and somebody that owns their own airplane is not the hours, but professional pilots use checklist every single time. So make sure you do. I'm going to put in under setup an alert to remind me to switch my tanks every 30 minutes. I can change time formats. I can turn Bluetooth on and off. I can do a bunch of different things under the setup. All of those will be covered in the expanded course. But right now I'm minus seven hours Zulu, so I'll make sure I put that in. And those are all the options you can change. Auxiliary over to system. There's my software. There's my databases. That shows GPS. And those are the two alerts that I have right now that I'm not talking to a comm antenna and I don't have a GPS antenna, so I have no GPS signal. That's why that alert tab is lit up yellow. So let's talk about the CDI knob. The CDI knob, if you push it, changes from GPS to OBS. If you turn it, it changes it from GPS to VLOC. VLOC means VOR or localizer, a ground-based radio station. So let's show you how that works. Push it once, and now I've got OBS. Now the next waypoint on my flight plan, go back to GPS. And eh, no, I really like OBS. Let's go back to OBS. Now if I spin the OBS, I can show radials from or to that next waypoint. This is really, really convenient if you get a controller saying go to this point and then go outbound on this heading. So now I've changed over to a VOR or localizer frequency. So what I'm going to do is put in Seal Beach, make that active, and then I can put in a course. You notice that I have two flags because I'm on the ground near my hangar and I'm not actually picking up that frequency. Or we can go back to OBS and again, you can even tune in a direct to course and show the pink line. So if you want to show that line instead of programming or changing your flight plan, you can. And just another way, Avidyne really makes flying much, much easier and safer. There is a light sensor directly above it, and this is my preferred setting. I don't like it tuned to the dim bus. Um, I really want it to use the light sensor because when it gets bright inside the airplane, the screen will get brighter. When it gets dark, it'll get darker. So let me show you real quick how to create a user waypoint. There's a special flight rules area in Los Angeles that is based on the Santa Monica VOR. Well, the problem is, is GPS is always more accurate. That's problem number one. Problem number two is the VOR was out of service for a couple of months. And people are going through there all day long announcing their tail number on a common traffic frequency for anyone in the LAX Fizz, though, to write down if they so desired, just going up and down using their iPads. iPads are never allowed for primary navigation. If you have a certified GPS unit installed in the plane, like an Avidyne, we can actually create a user waypoint 
they can legally replace it. So here's the Bravo. It really only covers a very small section. So this is based on the Santa Monica 132 radial. So we want to create a custom waypoint just south of the service Bravo. So the easiest way to do that is create a user waypoint there and then in the flight plan go from that user waypoint to the Santa Monica VOR. So if you have a paper chart somewhere, pull out a paper chart and a plotter, or you can use an iPad and figure out that it's about eight miles southeast of Santa Monica would clear you to the Bravo. Let's create that custom waypoint. So I'm in the FMS page and I'm on the waypoint tab. You'll notice the soft keys off to the left. We can create a new one by entering information or we can use our present position. So let's do a new one. I don't know the latitude and longitude, but let's name it first SFRA for Special Flight Rules Area. You can put in a longer name if you want to understand it. But I don't know the latitude and longitude. That didn't help. So I'm going to touch Format and change it to Radial and Distance. The fix is SMO, not KSMO. It's based on the VOR, not the airport. The Radial is 1, tree 2, Enter and the distance is 8. Enter. Everything looks good. I'm going to push Enter to save that. It's now stored. I'll declutter my map to make things easier to see. Now, if I go to Route and do a new route, Enter. I'm going to ch um, make the name of this new route here. Oh, sorry. Keep touching the my finger. Keep touches the the waypoint below that, which is why I like using the knobs in the keyboard better. I can't even do it well on the ground. I'll just name it SFRA. Okay, so that's what I'm going to name the route. Now I'll put in my origin as Long Beach. Select the waypoint as SFRA and see it'll automatically find it for you. Create the next waypoint as Santa Monica SMO. Enter. Back to route list. There it is. I'm going to activate that route. Confirm it. Go to the map button and look. There's my special flight rules, nice and legal, which takes me right through the Surface Bravo. It'll even show me my next waypoint after SFRA would be Santa Monica. So let's do a quick VFR flight plan including that special flight rules area. So I'm going to go to the FMS page, touch the flight plan tab, enter. Let's create that waypoint again, SFRA. The next waypoint being the Santa Monica VOR, enter, waypoint, enter. If I touch it, I can use the keyboard, S. M O enter and it geofills it automatically finds the nearest one for me anyway enter from Santa Monica let's go up to Camarillo they have the best barbecue restaurant in Southern California go get some of that good tri-tip everything's good now I can view expanded or compact or cursor and you'll notice it follows my entire route up that's a great way to make sure it works it's now active, the active route being pink, the next leg being the barber pole, pink and white. IFR flight plans are just as easy to put in. Now, of course, we go into much, much greater detail. We spend over an hour on VFR and IFR flight in the expanded programs, but let me show you how to get started. Same thing, FMS page, let's do a new route. And let's name it. 
IFR to Santa Barbara, KSBA. All right, let's enter the origin, being Long Beach, enter. Enter the next waypoint. Actually, no, I want to do a departure. So I'm going to scroll down and select Anaheim 6, Ventura Transition, and it's now put the entire thing in. After the Ventura, I'm going to go to the Quang intersection. You'll see why in just a minute. Then I'm going to go into my airport of Santa Barbara, enter. Now I need to select Santa Barbara. I go back there, select Santa Barbara, touch approach, activate my cursor, and pick the VOR25, which happens to start at, you guessed it, Quang. Enter. Everything's good. Now you'll notice it even shows the published missed approach. Let's scroll back up, make sure everything looks good. back to the route list and activate that route. Do I really want to activate it? Yep. Now when I touch view cursor, you'll see view cursor, I can now scroll through the flight plan and it will trace my route. And this is what you want to do before every single flight to make sure that the route you put in is correct. And this is something only the Avidyne does, which is really, really nice. It'll even show you the missed approach. So by being able to preview entire routes like this is really a great thing. So what does an IFR approach look like in real life? Let me give you a preview. One of my favorite uh, airports is Santa Rosa. That's uh, up near Napa where all the good wine is. And one of the approaches I like to shoot is the ILS runway 32 at the Sonoma County Airport which is actually, by the way, named for Charles M. Schultz, the guy who drew the peanuts, which is really funny because if you look at the intersections, there's intersections like Pigpen, Lucy, all the cool things. So let, let me show you what it looks like in real life. And this is an actual flight in IMC in my Cessna 206. So here we are, and we're on our way to EDOV. The next intersection would be Pigpen. You'll notice that I'm on VLOC, so I'm following the localizer, and you can see the green nav thing is lit up, and you'll under show that I'm underneath the glide slope. That's normal, you always intercept a glide slope from below. So let's show it in action. Flying along, got it backed up on another GPS, an antique Garmin's there below. It gives me a 10 second warning before I get to the next intersection. So in two, one, now I need to descend and go to pig pen. And that's exactly what it looks like. It's really, really great and very interactive. It gives you lots of warning, including when to descend. So you really do need to keep your database current, especially if you're an IFR pilot. And it's very, very simple to do. So let's update a database in the Avidyne. I've preloaded it on that USB key. I put the USB key in first, then I turn it on. It'll automatically go into maintenance mode. You'll see there's an update cycle automatically selected, and I'll push proceed. And you can see the progress as it uploads. And the Avidyne databases upload fairly quickly. Both the nav data and the obstacle databases only take a few seconds. Now, I've got the entire Western United States, and it happens fairly quickly. If you have the entire US plus Canada and other regions, it may take just a little bit longer. We'll let that upload all the way. You'll notice I can also save the checklist and save settings as a backup uh, on that same USB key. Okay, 
it's copied all the Victor Airways. Now all I have to do is everything's done with no error, push done. At this point, I would take the USB key out. I didn't when I filmed this video, but it's pretty easy to bump those USB keys and I don't want to break anything off. So my recommendation to you is to pull them out at this point. It'll go through my splash screen again. I'll push enter after doing my required check of the OBS to the left. And you'll see that now my nav data is current, but my obstacles are not. So current databases are white, expired databases are yellow. Do you really want to fly with an expired obstacle database? Sure, we will this time. And that's how you update the database. Now, how do you actually get stuff on the USB key? Well, you're going to use a program from Jeppesen, and it's very similar, Mac or PC. I happen to have a Mac, so let me show you how that looks on a Mac. I'm going to log in with my username and my password. Click login. I'll agree to any software terms. I have two databases that are available. One is obstacles and one is nav data. So I'm just going to drag them onto the Avidyne named USB key. Now let's move the nav data one over. Just drag it right on over to Avidyne. Now if you lose the Avidyne, you can get another USB key from Avidyne, or you can just go buy one at Office Depot, whatever. They're all about the same. I like using the Avidyne key because it says Avidyne, but you can change the title of those things. Now, legally required, I have to click View Alerts and Notices, and this is something most people don't do. This is a legal requirement to use the database because there could be a problem with the database. So now that I've clicked View Alerts, and by the way, even if you're a renter pilot, you do need to view these alerts before you use a Jeppesen database. It's a legal requirement of all databases. Basically, you're checking for no TAMs and changes. So you can just go to jeppesen.com and search for notices and alerts. When you get to that page, it looks like this. I'm going to click View on All Aviation Notices and Alerts. I'm going to pick the US. Maybe I just want to look at one state, or maybe I want to look at all of them. There are 10 nav data alerts in the US. And here's a critical one for Alaska, that there's a major problem on that approach. And here are some other things, including going back several cycles. So if you're a renter pilot and the database is three months out, you can still go back and find them. You'll notice there's things wrong with a, an ILS in Colorado as well. If you want to look at the actual PDF, you can bring up that urgent warning. Therefore, use caution of flying the ILS or the localizer Z into Canada because there are problems with the database. Now, it may be a mistake in the database, or it may be a NOTAM was released after the database, but you are legally required to do that. And then you just put the USB key in, and it'll pull up those things. So how do you get your position from the Avidyne to your iPad? Well, this works with several different programs, like FlyQ and ForeFlight. Basically, you just need to connect your iPad to the Avidyne. The great thing about the Avidyne is you don't have to buy any flight streams or data links or anything goofy like that. Wi-Fi and Bluetooth are built in. So what I want to do is I'm just going to touch settings on the iPad and connect to the Wi-Fi. And the one I want is the LIO Wi-Fi. That is the Avidyne Navigator. It'll connect. Now, pick your favorite program. I like FlyQ and ForeFlight. Let's open up, in this case, for flight. Touch the Find Me button. And look, there I am outside the hangar at Long Beach. 
So you don't need an external GPS now because it will provide one. Now I do use a Stratus 2 um, and I normally don't let the Avidyne connect to my iPad um, because I want ads be weather and traffic from the Stratus. Now I'm also adding the ads B capability through some Avidyne products. They, they have a, uh, an ads B solution that's very affordable and very easy to install. I'm just waiting on that and I'm going to install it. But until then, I leave it to the Stratus because I want full synthetic vision and everything on that. Now, with the Avidyne 550, with the synthetic vision, of course, you wouldn't need that on your iPad. The only thing you need to know is it's a secure Wi-Fi network. And by the way, it can connect to several different devices. Wi-Fi is Wi-Fi. If you got four people on the plane and they all want to connect their iPads to it, they certainly can. Just make sure you take a screenshot or write this password down. The Wi-Fi password is fixed and it's Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, Echo, Foxtrot, one, two, three, four. Now, one of the benefits of having your iPad connected to it is you can automatically download the flight plan from your Avidyne directly into For Flight Fly Q or the other programs. And there's going to be even more functionality as soon as 10.2 is released, including a great Avidyne iPad app, which is going to be even better. So let me show you how to do that. So we've got a flight plan stored from Monterey to Long Beach in my Avidyne, and it's active. To download a flight plan onto our iPad, for this case using ForeFlight, as long as it's connected to the Wi-Fi generated by your Avidyne IFD 440, 540, or 550, it's pretty simple. As long as you have an active flight plan, in this case from Monterey down to Long Beach, all we do is we go over to ForeFlight and we're looking for a little Wi-Fi symbol. We're going to touch that and put load from panel. Now it's loaded our flight plan which if we touch our route button here we'll zoom in and it shows the entire same route. Now as more functionality is added with the new 10.2 software in Avidyne you'll be able to send flight plans both ways. Alright, so let's talk very quickly there are warnings, cautions, and advisory. Warnings are always red, and that is you need to do something, you're in an emergency mode. A caution is yellow. You need to do something before it becomes an emergency. Blue is an advisory, nice to know. What's an example of a warning? Well, a critical terrain. You're about to hit something, and what that would look like is you'd get a flashing red button in the bottom and the auxiliary button will turn red. If you see terrain pull up, you need to execute an emergency climb. A caution would be yellow. And again, you might have a caution terrain. Yellow does not mean you're safe. Yellow says, we think you're going to hit something within 60 seconds. You should still execute a climb. Another alert might be this. By the way, your alternator has broken, and this happened to me. My alternator mount broke, broke the belt, damaged the fan, and I got a low volts. That was my first clue to go look at the am, uh, ammeter and notice that I was discharging. Advisories, something I recommend you put in, even if you don't need to switch tanks. So if you're in a high wing Cessna like a 172, 152 where you're always running both tanks, I still want you to put a switch tanks alert every 30 minutes because it will then remind you to check the fuel gauges. Now we know fuel gauges don't work. We know fuel gauges are always wrong. I get that. But if your fuel gauge shows something dramatically different than what you expect, you may have a fuel leak and you should land and fix it. 
and that's what a switch tanks alert. Now in my two Cessna 206, we actually do run left tank or right tank. There is no both selection. And I typically want the alert every 30 minutes. Whether I change tanks or not is dependent on me, but it reminds me every 30 minutes. At least one to two people every single week land off airport because they're out of gas in the airplane. And you would not believe, as a lead safety rep for the FAA, all I do is read accident reports. Y'all would just not even believe it if I told you how many of those pilots had gas in the other tank. They just ran one tank dry. Avidine makes things safer. It's going to generate a warning, but you have to program it to do it. Well, I think my voice is done. I think we're coming up on that hour time limit where I'm just about done with this intro video. So let's just turn the thing off. To turn it off, press and hold the power button. You may want to do this just to cycle through if it's having trouble finding a GPS position, but let's go ahead and stop the video. I just don't have the time to cover all the other stuff in detail. I haven't even had a chance to tell you about the great synthetic vision on the IFD 550. Haven't, needed, haven't even had a chance to show you the cool electronic charts available or what a train system really looks like. Haven't even had a chance to tell you that Avidyne is rolling out their own app, which will make a free glass panel airplane out of your airplane by making an iPad mini or an, a full-size iPad Pro an exact working duplicate of your Avidyne. Okay, I could spend 60 grand and do a Garmin G500 or G600, or I go to Best Buy for 800 bucks and buy a really nice iPad and look at all the functionality you will have. So how are you gonna get really good? Well, I hope this video's giving you a good start. How are you gonna get really good at this? First of all, read the pilot's guide. Second of all, download the free simulator for iPads. There's a free simulator that can mimic a 440 or a 540. It's just something you change in the settings. So we'll download the America database. And look at that. There's a nice Avidyne 540 simulator. It's got a built-in simulator so you can actually show flying the course. And it's a really good way to do things. If you just need a simple question answered, go on over to pilotsafety.org. That's where you're going to find me. And you just click on Ask the Experts. I'm happy to answer one or two simple questions for free. I am a volunteer. I do have a real job, but I am a volunteer for pilot safety. So give me a little bit of time. <laughs> Y'all, uh, the funniest story I, I always tell about Ask the Experts button is I had a guy send me this 300 word essay on why I was such an incredible loser at five minutes after midnight. And the reason I got this 300 page essay being a loser um, was because I didn't respond within five minutes to his original email at midnight. I'm typically asleep at midnight, so I, I do apologize to that particular gentleman. Now, if you want to get really good, go on over to pilotsafety.org and get the five and a half, almost six hour program either as DVDs or USB stick. Um, and in the future, you'll even be able to watch it instantly online. But we really like the DVDs and the USB sticks better because you can repeatedly play them back under chapters. You can also just go to pilotsafety.org and click on the Avidine tab and watch free videos like this, read interesting articles, and even download checklists and free how-to pages that I'll be adding soon. If you really want to be a pro, tell you what, I'll come to you. That's what I do for a living. You're going to buy an Avidine, I'll come to Chicago for three days, and I'll spend three days making you an expert at IFR, an incredible IFR boot camp. iPad use, the Avidine program, especially in emergencies, and make you really good. I'd love to work with you. All you got to do is go over to Master Flight Training and say, hey, Gary, come get me. Y'all, I hope you enjoyed this introductory, uh, introductory video or DVD, whichever format you're watching. Congratulations on the purchase of your Avidine. And everybody, just tell all your friends, hey, anybody will sell you avionics. Avidine is the only national company.
to provide a getting started how-to video. And I think we should all be really proud of that. So thanks to Avidine and thanks to you. I hope you enjoy your new navigators as much as I enjoy mine. Y'all, thanks for listening. I'm Gary with pilotsafety.org.